welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Good day, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and you? At least it's not as hot as last time. Oh, yeah, no, last time we had a, a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's a little bit cooler today. The, the topic is still hot. So let me open with a word of prayer, then we can get into it. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us again together. Lord, we need you more and more each day. Please bless us with the inworking of the Holy Spirit and that we can have discernment. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sometimes I think that Rome is purposefully provocative. Mm to see how far can they push their agendas without one word of remonstrance from Protestants. Yeah. And it always surprises me how successful they are. Correct. No, t not no body even mentions anything about what we're going to discuss. No. So we're going to talk a little bit about prayers for the dead because it's not only prayers for the dead, but actually also prayers to, to the, the dead. dead. Yeah. After all, if you can invoke the help of saints, then you are praying to the saints, yes. right? So this was a major issue in the Reformation, but it seems to be dead at the moment with no no sign of a resurrection on the side of Protestantism. Mm. Here's an article that appeared recently on the October the 23rd, and it's in Crooks, which is talking about the Catholic pulse, and it says that the Vatican extends time to obtain full indulgences for souls in purgatory. Mm. So that same old issue that arose in the Reformation is purposefully being dangled before the eyes and noses of the world yes. just to rub it in that Rome has not changed. Exactly. That's how I feel about it. I mean, Martin Luther. It was very clear, right? Yeah, and that's m the m one of the main reasons he wrote his 95 Thesis. Absolutely. So let's just look at this article. Rome plenary or full indulgences traditionally obtained during the first week of November for the souls of the faithful in purgatory can now be gained throughout the entire month of November. Isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> now, it always amazes me that they have these times when you can get a full indulgence in November. Now, if it was in your power to relieve the suffering mm -hmm. of individuals, wouldn't you want to do it in January, February, March, April, yeah. May, June, July, August, September, October, November, every day on a daily basis? Exactly. No, but we'll do it in November and let those guys suffer for the rest of the year, right? <laughs> this makes no sense to me whatsoever. But nevertheless, you can now gain it for the whole of November. Also, those who are ill or homebound and would not be able to physically visit a church or a cemetery in the prescribed time frame still will be able to receive a plenary indulgence when meeting certain conditions. The Apostolic Penitentiary, a Vatican tribunal that deals with matters of conscience, said in a notice released October 23. And then they have this picture of women who are praying on All Souls Day at a cemetery. So you can get an indulgence if you go to a cemetery. That's fascinating. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the tribunal also asked that priests be particularly generous throughout November in offering the sacrament of reconciliation in administering communion to those who are infirm. The new provisions were made after a number of bishops asked for guidance as to how the faithful could perform the works required for receiving a plenary indulgence 
Given the ongoing pandemic and restrictions in many parts of the world, limiting the number of people who can gather in any one place. This is interesting that uh, the Roman Catholic Church continues with its activity, continues with its mass and all of these issues. But in Protestant nations, it is forbidden in many countries to have communion services. Mm -hmm. Amazing, isn't Amazing. it? Amazing. No baptisms. No. You're allowed to sit at the restaurant and eat, mm. but you can't partake of a communion service. Mm. Traditionally, the faithful could receive a full indulgence each day from November 1 to November 8 when they visited the cemetery to pray for the departed and fulfilled other conditions, in particularly when they went to a church or an oratory to pray, November 2, All Souls Day. Bishops' conference in countries where large numbers of faithful traditionally go to confession, attend mass and visit cemeteries during the week had asked how the faithful could be accommodated given COVID-19 restrictions. Or in the case that a member of the faithful was ill, in isolation or in quarantine, the Cardinal said. So the Vatican decided to extend the time one can receive a full indulgence to include the whole month of November. Typically, only a partial indulgence is granted after the first week of November. That's even more interesting. So one week... And after that, <laughs> you can get a partial <laughs> indulgence, but unfortunately your loved one who is in purgatory has to suffer a little longer because you missed, you missed. it's just not going to happen, <laughs> right? That yeah. doesn't make sense. Oh, no. Isn't this dangling something in front of Protestants who believe the scriptures and understand what it's all about? Can you imagine if God was like this? with your salvation. Oh. Uh, you're, you're just a little bit too late, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you would thought about it... A week earlier, <laughs> it would have been okay. It would have been okay, yeah. Those who cannot leave their homes or residence for serious reasons, which included government restrictions during a pandemic, he said, also can receive a plenary indulgence after reciting specific prayers for the deceased or reflecting on a gospel reading designated for masses of the dead before an image of Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary or by performing a work of mercy. Now, my young friend, how much of that is biblical? None. None of it? No. Are in, you sure? In actual fact, to pray for an idol is against the commandments. It's or in front of an idol. Yeah, it's, it's forbidden in the scriptures. And uh, here's a works-related thing. So this is amazing. In all cases, one also must fulfill the normal requirements set by the church for all the plenary indulgences, which demonstrate a resolve to turn away from sin and convert to God. So what are those conditions? They include having a spirit detached from sin going to confession as soon as possible, receiving the Eucharist as soon as possible, praying for the Pope's intentions, and being united spiritually with all the faithful. Those are church rules. And nowhere do I read anything like that in the Bible. Mm. You don't go to confession as soon as possible in the Bible. When you have sinned, you confess your sins to God and to God alone. Who can forgive sins but God oh, alone, mm. says the Bible. And they also said that the office strongly urged all priests to celebrate Mass three times on All Souls Day, as allowed for in a 1915 document by Pope Benedict XV. The hope is that the availability of more Masses that day would help everyone wanting to attend Mass to do so while respecting capacity limits in churches and places of worship. The church teaches that prayer, 
particularly the Mass and sacrifices, may be offered on behalf of the souls in purgatory. The Feast of All Souls differs from the November 1 Feast of All Saints precisely because it offers prayer for the eternal peace and heavenly rest of all those who died in a state of grace but not totally purified. Uh, that's the bulk of humanity according to them. Mm. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church says all who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. A total negation of mm. justification by faith. Exactly. So this is dangled in front of the Protestant world mm -hmm. that sits with this church in ecumenical mm -hmm. council mm -hmm. and for the sake of that wonderful word called solidarity goes along with any compromise whatsoever mm. and thereby crucifying Christ afresh. Yes. Now, this is a serious issue and it is an issue that affects the entire world and in particular the Christian world. Mm. Because this is not the first time this has come up. It was a big issue in the time of Christ. Mm. And uh, it is a big issue in many religions in the world. This praying to the dead, praying for the dead, ancestor worship, all of these issues are involved here. Now, let's just get a Catholic definition, just to make sure. This is Catholic Answers, and the article is Salvific Offerings for the Dead. Mm. Now, what does salvific mean? For salvation. Absolutely. So now, you can bring an offering for, offering for the salvation of the dead. Mm. I thought... The Bible said, it is given for man once to die, mm. thereafter the judgment. Yes. But here, you can do something for the souls after they are dead, right? Yeah. So if they didn't live the up to the standard of the Bible, yes. now you can do offerings and pray for them that they can be saved without them having to acknowledge it themselves. Correct. Some religions go so far as to say, you can baptize the dead. Well, but let's not go there. Offerings for the dead. As faithful Catholics, we are taught that we should offer prayers and reparations for the dead. How can you do a reparation for something that someone has done who is already dead? Is that possible? No. If there's going to be a reparation, it has to happen before you're dead, no. right? When you have a decision to make. This is a spiritual work of mercy, a meritorious act on our part. It is, in fact, a foolish act. Because once you are dead, it's too late to do any reparation. The reparation should come before you die. Yeah. What does the Bible say about prayers for the dead? Well, we have some interesting verses here and uh, I've uh, used the ESV translation as well because it translates some words as necromancers, which others don't necessarily translate that way. Deuteronomy 18 verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found amongst you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. That's someone who consults the dead. Yeah. It is strictly forbidden in the word of God. 
Leviticus 19 verse 31 says in the King James, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Now the ESV translates that verse, do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Mm. That's people that consult the dead. dead yeah. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Why would you be unclean when you consult the dead? Because the Bible is pretty clear that the dead know nothing. nothing. Mm. So who are you actually consulting when you are consulting the dead? Demons. You are talking to demons, masquerading as loved ones. Yes. Here are a few more verses. Isaiah 8 verse 19 in the King James and in the ESV. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Mm. So the Bible clearly says that if you don't speak in harmony with the word of God, the law is the Torah, yeah. the testimony is what all the prophets have written after that. If you do not speak in harmony with that, there's no light in them. Yeah. The ESV says quite plainly, inquire of the medians and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. That's a, a, a reference to non-understandable utterings. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Leviticus 20 verse 6 in the ESV, if a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from amongst these people. That's pretty serious. Yeah. In other words, when you indulge in these things, you are going contrary to the will of God yes. because you are receiving instructions from demons. Yeah. Leviticus 20 verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, that was under the theocracy. We don't have a theocracy anymore, so you can't go and do that. But basically what God is saying is that in the final analysis and the final judgment, that comes to with the death penalty. Yeah. Deuteronomy 14 verse 1, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor make any boldness between your eyes for the dead. Now, when you go to the religions and you look up the word tonja, it is the practice of cutting or shaving some or all of the hair on the scalp as a sign of religious devotion or humility. Actually, no. It is a cutting for the dead. Mm. Now, if you go back to the old pagan religions, back to Nimrod's time, then uh, we learn that Nimrod, of course, was put to death. And it was a custom to tonder yourself, to show that you are in solidarity, let's use that word, with, with this yeah. dead principle. So the term originates from the Latin word tonsura, meaning clipping or shearing, and referred to a specific practice in medieval Catholicism abandoned by papal order in 1972. Now, that is interesting, but we still find that clipping is a very common practice in the world in many religions. Yes. And uh, nuns used to have their hair clipped and shaven. That's why they wore a, a tabot. Mm -hmm. And we find it also in other religions. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 26 verse 14 says, I have not eaten thereof in my morning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. In other words, the Bible clearly says we have nothing to do in terms of any form of communication 
with the dead. Mm. That doesn't mean you can't remember the dead. No. That ca- doesn't mean you do not sorrow for the dead. But there is no communication and there is no change of status that is possible. Yes. So here is a, is a question that was asked. Why do Buddhists honor our dead by feeding them? If the dead know nothing, mm-hmm. then can you feed them? No. Catholic answers that article on salvific prayers. Yeah. If we continue to read what they explain there, it says, from the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them. Above all, the Eucharist sacrifice so that, thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Now, all of these activities are strictly forbidden in the Word of God. Yes. So it's not only in re- non-Christian religions that we find this practice, but here in the heart of Catholicism, we find it as well. Let us help and commemorate them. Can you help the dead? No. If Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, mm-hmm. why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. Well, as I said before, now the world sits in an ecumenical council and the Protestant world assumes that Rome is a Christian institution Mm -hmm. functioning according to biblical principles And then we have issues like this document that has just been released. Yeah. And uh, what are your thoughts? My thoughts is that it's important that you're saying this because a lot of people will be looking at this episode now and sitting and saying, okay, but we're not Catholics. So it doesn't apply to us. But you are accepting Catholic principles in your life. That's what it's important to realize like you said, this ecumenical agreements with them. Now, does God work in harmony with error? No. So the leading that we find and the example that we find from this system, which is being incorporated in the legislation of the entire world, world. does it emanate from a pure stream or does it emanate from a defiled, defiled stream? One. Yes. That is the question we have to ask ourselves. Now, when the Reformation was celebrated, the 500th year of the Reformation, Mm -hmm. they brought out all kinds of documents, and this was one of them. The Declaration on the Way, Church Ministry and the Eucharist. And it was the question of unity between brethren of different denominations. And one of the issues that was mentioned in this document on page 36, the U.S. dialogue around uh, this document, the hope of eternal life, asserts the following. The fellowship of those sanctified, the holy ones or saints, includes believers both living and dead. Now this is a document of unification of the Protestant world with the Catholic Catholic world. world. There is thus a solidarity of the church. I'm very allergic to that word. Mm -hmm. Solidarity. It is being branded everywhere today. And there are quotes available on the web of Pope Francis using this word. Yep. But it is popping up on a regular basis in Protestant documents. Yes. Solidarity. Does that mean that you can have solidarity in blatant error? No, in blatant Bla- apostasy, apostasy against God's word mm. and rebellion against his word. So, so you have to compromise the whole time. You have to. And in the previous one, uh, episode, didn't we see 
how you can obtain common good is via compromise. What was the downfall of Israel? A compromise. Uh, yeah, it was called syncretism. Yeah. Mixing pagan worship with true worship. Mm. In other words, worshiping Baal in the name of Jehovah. Exactly. So it's amazing that this document says that the fellowship includes the living and the dead. So you are actually celebrating the Eucharist together with the dead. There is thus a solidarity of the church throughout the world with the church triumphant. This solidarity across the barrier of death is particularly evident in the Eucharist, which is always celebrated in unity with the hosts of heaven. So the dead partake. Partake. Particularly in praise and adoration of God at the Lord's table, the apparent division marked by death melts away. <laughs> so you have one big feast. One big feast of celebrating together with the dead. Mm. That is as pagan as it can possibly be. Correct. Now what does spiritualism teach on this issue? Well, spiritualism has six basic fundamental principles. And this comes from their own sources. They acknowledge the existence of a supreme intelligence. Mm. Doesn't have to be a personal God, right? No. And of course, the immortality of the soul. We are in essence spirits, all of whom are created simple and ignorant, but owning the power to gradually perfect themselves, which is impossible. Mm -hmm. According to the scripture, your perfection is imputed or imparted from God. Yes. And there is nothing that you can do because all our righteousness is filthy rags. Yes. Reincarnation is then possible if you are a living spirit after death. Plurality of inhabited worlds, the different orbs of the universe are the various abodes of the spirits. So that means you can communicate with them, right? Mm -hmm. Communicability of the spirits. Spirits are the disincarnate human beings. Spirits can communicate with our material world through mediums. What did we just read in the Bible? <laughs> no necromancy. No talking to the it's dead. It's forbidden. And then morale based on the gospel of Jesus. That is syncretism of the highest order. This should already bring warning lights to people thinking that after thinking that okay but we're not thinking uh, and uh, exactly like the catholics do we don't pray to the dead but you still believe that they are in heaven and that you can after, talk to after them. death and how can you say that something that is contrary to the gospel of jesus christ is based on the gospel of jesus christ so when those three unclean spirits mm. come together out of the mouth of the beast, which is Catholicism, out of the mouth of Protestantism, mm -hmm. and out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Spiritism, then you have the final union that will bring about the conflict between righteousness and unrighteousness. And this is exactly where we are yes. in the stream of time. Correct. Now, if you are silent on an issue, mm. then you actually condone it. The Bible says if you warn the wicked man, then you've done your duty. Mm. If you don't, it's upon your head. And this is the case with Protestantism. It is silent on this issue. Yes. The doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Ezekiel 18 verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And here you're talking about this word that is translated soul. Mm -hmm. It shall die. Because the whole of the human being is the soul. And man became a living mm. soul. You have to have the dust and the breath of God to constitute constitute a soul 
Correct. Is one can't exist without the other. Correct. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. It is only the King eternal who is immortal. 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 16 says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality. The only one who has immortality is God. And those to whom he grants it. Yes. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. It's pretty clear that the Bible teaches that God alone is immortal. And Jesus said in John 11, 11 to 14, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. And then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Mm. Now, if you are in Christ, then you're not really dead. Yeah. But when you cease to exist in your present state, then you are in a state of sleep. Yes. Unconsciousness. And how long will you remain in that state? Well, Job tells us in 14 verse 12, till the heavens be no more. And the Bible tells us when Christ comes, the heavens shall depart like a scroll. scroll. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. It's pretty clear. Mm. Psalm 6 verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalms 115 verse 17. Didn't that Catholic document just say that when you hold the Mass that the dead praise God? Yeah, they partake with you and they are there. Now, which one is right, the Catholic document or the Bible? Well, Isn't that a choice that people will choice. have to make? So, rust in peace is what seems to be what the Bible says. Now, we've discussed this many times, but just to make sure that uh, we understand it in its completeness, it was the devil who said, you shall be as gods and that you will be immortal. Genesis 3, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. You shall be as gods. So the Bible is very, very clear. Mm. Immortality is conditional to obedience to God. Now the Catholic Church knows this very well. In the Office of the Catechism, Article 1, 366, the Church teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. Very well put. Yeah. It's the church that teaches it. Mm -hmm. Not the Bible. Does that church know that the Bible teaches something else? That's yes. a question, I right? Well, you have to see. Well, here's the New Catholic Encyclopedia, and it says the soul in the Old Testament means not a part of man, but the whole man. Do they know? Yes as a living being. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human, human life. life. The life of an individual conscious object. Recent exegetes have maintained that the New Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. Does the Catholic Church know what the Bible teaches? Yes. Does it teach contrary to the Bible? 100%. 100%. And it makes no bones about it. No. So Can, I, can I sit in the ecumenical council with it? How do you have solidarity with that? How do you have solidarity? What, we make a compromise? Mm. What compromise can you make? So now we s put some things on the side. We're actually compromising the Bible. 
So if it's either one or the other, then it can't be both. No. Fascinating. Now how adamant are they about it? Pope Leo X, in 1513, now remember this is just before the Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. He said, we do condemn and reprobate all who assert that the intelligent soul is mortal. And this bull was a directed against the growing, what they called heresy, of those who denied the natural immortality of the soul and avowed the conditional immortality of man. In other words, if you believe the Bible, yes. then you were condemned as reprobate. So they're very adamant about it. Their doctrine will or, stand mm. and the Bible one will not. Well, in his 1520 published defense of 41 of his propositions, Luther cited the Pope's in the immortality declaration as, quote, one of those monstrous opinions to be found in the Roman dunghill of decretals. He had a way with words, <laughs> Martin Luther. <laughs> so he didn't agree with it, right? No, definitely not. Now, why not? Well, Archbishop Francis Blackburn states that Luther espoused the doctrine of the sleep of the soul upon a scripture foundation. And then he made use of it as a confutation of purgatory and saint worship and continued in that belief to the last moment of his life. Now the reformers had an example before them. They call themselves Lutherans mm. and they don't believe what Luther believed. Yeah. In fact, they left this out of their catechism. We should learn to view our death, said Martin Luther, in the right light so that we need not become alarmed on account of it as unbelief does. Because in Christ it is indeed not death, but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yes. Which brings us release from this veil of tears, from sin and from the fear and extremity of real death and from all the misfortunes of this life. And we shall be secure and without care rest sweetly and gently for a brief moment as on a sofa until the time when he shall awaken us together with all his dear children to his eternal glory and joy. That was Martin Luther's face. After all, he translated the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. So he must have internalized those verses and thought about them to come to this conclusion. For since we call it a sleep, we know that we shall not remain in it, but again awaken and live, and that the time during which we sleep shall seem no longer than if we had just fallen asleep. Hence, we shall censure ourselves that we were surprised or alarmed at such a sleep in the hour of death and suddenly come alive out of the grave and from decomposition and entirely well fresh with pure, clear, glorified life meet our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the clouds. Did he study his scriptures? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. He translated them so he knew what he was talking about. And then he says, Scripture everywhere affords such consolation, which speaks of the death of saints, as if they fell asleep and were gathered to their fathers. That is, had overcome death through the, this faith and comfort in Christ, and awaited the resurrection together with the saints who preceded them in death. Now, the resurrection... Was it contentious in Jesus' day? Yes, very much so. The Sadducees and the Pharisees mm -hmm. had very different views on the resurrection. Yeah. And Jesus plainly taught the resurrection from yeah. the dead. He rebuked the, the Sadducees. So a fascinating war which has been ongoing from the beginning. Yeah. Now William Tyndall 
was also one who translated the Bible and paid the ultimate price mm. for what he did. And British Bible translator came to the defense of the revised teaching of conditional immortality. This, as well as other teachings, brought him in direct conflict with the papal champion Thomas More, who strongly objected against Tyndall and Luther, who in words of Moore said, all souls lie and sleep till doomsday. So the Catholic Church says this is not going to be accepted. In 1530, Tyndall responded vigorously saying, speaking to Thomas More now, and ye, in putting them, the departed souls, in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me why they be not in as good case as the angels be, and then what cause is there of a resurrection? Yeah. Makes no sense. No. So today, the Adventists believe in the death, soul sleep, resurrection. So you sleep until doomsday. Mm. This is a biblical position. It was taught in the Bible. It was taught by the founders yeah. of the Reformation movement. Tyndall pressed his contention even further, showing that the papal teaching on the subject is in conflict with Paul. So he's, he sarcastically says, Nay, Paul, thou art unlearned. You must go to Master Moore <laughs> and learn a new way. We be not most miserable, though we rise not again, for our souls go to heaven as soon as we be dead. And are there in great joy as Christ that is risen again. And I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with that doctrine if he had wished it, if he had known it, that the souls of the dead should rise again, if the souls be in heaven in as great glory as the angels after your doctrine, show me what cause should there be of the resurrection. Pretty logical argument. Yes. So this is coming to the fore again at the, in the time that we are living. Yes. And that the papacy should in this very day and in this very month that we are recording yeah, this issue, bring this to the fore again and rub it under the noses of the Protestants without one word of remonstrance yes. is astounding. It is. It just shows you where we are in this dream of time, like you said. Yes. We are at the end. Now, I know that there are many that will say, oh, there they go again with this mm. Adventist doctrine. Mm -hmm. Let me show you an article by Warren Prestige. And this is a Baptist mm. who has studied this and written an article on it. And I think we should just browse through the article. 100%. Just to make sure that it is not only the Adventists that no. believe like this, but everyone who really studies, studies the, the Bible. Issue. Yes. Absolutely. Here is the article, and there is the, the web page as quoted. And it's by Warren Prestige. And Warren Prestige has a number of degrees, and he's a Baptist pastor, and he taught at uh, secondary schools and universities, and he authored this article on the sleep of death. And he opens up the, arg the argument with the sleep of death. According to the Bible, the dead, whether Christian or non-Christian, good or evil, saved or lost, are neither suffering in hell, nor laboring in purgatory, nor rejoicing in heaven. Rather, they have entirely ceased to function. This is now, as I would say, an independent source. Yeah. Without consciousness, they await the resurrection of the dead at the return of Christ, that is, Jesus in the glory of God. To use a common biblical metaphor, they sleep the sleep of death. 
And then he quotes Psalms 13, verse 3. Now, what is the sleep of death? In the Old Testament, dying is frequently referred to as laying down in sleep. And the dead are said to be asleep. Three different Hebrew words are used to this effect. The first one is shachbat. I probably don't pronounce that correctly. <laughs> But nevertheless, and then he gives the examples, Deuteronomy 31, 1 Kings 2, and he says, David slept with his ancestors and was buried. And then he says, compare Acts 13, verse 36, and over 30 similar incidences. Second, Yashen, examples, Job 3, verse 13, Psalms 13, verse 3, and Daniel. The dead sleep in the dust of the earth, and the third one is Shenach. For instance, Job 14 verse 12, the dead will not awake or be aroused out of their sleep. The sleep of death affects all humans the same way. There the wicked cease from trouble and there the weary are at rest. It is a perpetual sleep. No dreaming is hinted at. Rather, the metaphor signifies utter inactivity, unconsciousness, and in effect, non-existence. That's Beautiful. what the Bible teaches, yes. according to Beautiful. it. Now, we're not going to read the whole article. He quotes many verses, and we've looked at some of them. For now I shall lie, that Hebrew word over there, shachap. Sleep in the earth, and you, God, will seek me, but I shall not be. He talks about the story of the witch of Endor as a problem verse mm -hmm. in this issue. But then again, God forbade the speaking to, oh, yeah, to mediums mm -hmm. and necromancers. And he never ever saw Samuel. Mm. It is only the witch of Endo that told him that it was Samuel. Yes. So we don't have to be caught by that particular verse. He talks about the word shoal. He said, what then of this word shoal, which we have already encountered a couple of times? The Hebrew word shoal occurs some 65 times in the Old Testament with a reference to the place or state of the dead. The New Testament equivalent is Hades. And he uses, as an example, Acts chapter 2, verse 24 to 28, although often misleadingly translated as hell. Shoal is never once depicted in the Old Testament as a place or state of suffering. In fact, of the wicked, it can be said, in peace they go mm -hmm. down to Shoal. The true import of the word is clearly conveyed by various equivalents given in the same context. The equivalents are the pit in various verses, destruction in various verses, silence in other verses, corruption in other verses, the grave the dust, death, and that is what is referred to, never a place. Mm. He says, Ellis explains, shoal in the dust and is probably best understood generically as the grave. He talks about the verses of being asleep in Christ, and there are many that the Bible mentions. We're not going to go through all of them. We want to get to the gist of the matter. And that is diverse Christian traditions. So he gives a nice Bible study mm -hmm. showing that the dead sleep. And then he talks about these diverse Christian traditions. And he makes this statement. Now, this is not an Adventist, right? It is scandalous that despite the clear, consistent teaching of both the Hebrew and the Greek Testament, Christian tradition has displayed great confusion over the death state. 
Today, it is very widely recognized that this has been due largely to the influence of ancient Greek ideas. Now, when we go to the book of Revelation, mm. the body of the sea beast is the leopard, yes. right? And that stands for? Greece. So the body, the mm. structure of the Roman thinking is Greek philosophy, natural law, mm -hmm. state of the dead. We can go through the entire list. It's based on Greek philosophy. An influence already strong in some pre-Christian Jewish circles, Paul Althaus explains, the original biblical concepts have been replaced by ideas from Hellenistic, Greek, Gnostic dualism. The New Testament idea of resurrection, which affects the total man, has to give way to the immortality of the soul. The two are not compatible. No. You cannot have a resurrection of the dead and immortality at the same time, which makes what? resurrection yeah. irrelevant. So it had to give way to this doctrine of the immortality of the soul. The last day also loses its significance. Mm -hmm. For souls have received all that is decisively important long before this. If you die and you go to heaven, you've got your reward. Why would you want to be resurrected? <laughs> yes. Doesn't make any sense. Eschatological tension, that is Christian hope, is no longer directed to the day of Jesus' coming. The difference between this and the hope of the New Testament is very great. And then he quotes here, during the Middle Ages, an elaborate fourfold doctrine of the death state was evolved in the Western Christian Church. And this schema is reflected in Dante's great poem, The Divine Comedy, and became standard for Roman Catholicism. In other words, you have this inferno where you go to yeah. Dante's Inferno, and uh, this is the state of the Christian world. He also writes that all the 16th century Protestant reformers rejected the doctrine of purgatory for three good reasons. It is not found anywhere in the Bible, it is contrary to the fundamental salvation by grace alone. Obviously. Right? You yeah. can do good works for the dead. Exactly. <laughs> it is open to terrible abuse, as when the medieval church claimed the power to relieve the suffering of those in purgatory and charged the faithful money to do so. Some added a fourth reason. There is no immortal human soul. Now, as we have just seen, was this only the medieval church? No. It started already in Jesus' time. And what about the present Pope? Didn't yeah. he just lengthen the indulgence period? It hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. Through the Reformation, a simplified scheme emerged. According to common Protestant view of death, the souls of the lost go immediately to punishment in hell, while the souls to be saved go immediately to heaven, there to enjoy full conscious communion with Christ. Mm. So the Protestants have just skipped the purgatory bit. Correct. Although this is widely assumed today to be the Christian view, it is neither the Roman Catholic view because they claim you go to purgatory yeah. first, right? As we have seen, nor the view of the Orthodox Church, nor has it been widely held by Christians at all until comparatively recently. So when people say that the Adventists are always contrary to everyone else, here is someone who is studying the issue and coming to the conclusion that the only way to resolve this issue is to stick to the scriptures. Correct. So it's not arrogance. It's just simply obeying the word of God. As a matter of fact, he writes, the idea of the soul's immediately ascent to heaven at death is of Greek Gnostic origin. 
not biblical or Christian. In my opinion, it is precisely this view that the Apostle Paul is arguing against in his great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Those he opposes there saw no need of a resurrection, verse 12, precisely because they assumed, in line with their Greek Platonist upbringing, that the soul is immortal and held that saved souls go to heaven immediately at death. And then he has this interesting quote from Bruce Winter. We'll just read a portion. Not surprisingly then, this view was also roundly opposed by prominent 2nd and 3rd century Christian teachers, such as Justin Martyr. So even in the early centuries of Christianity, there was this war raging. Yes. It has never stopped. Because the devil had said, you will surely not Not die, die. and his word is going to be law. In fact, it is Catholic canon law. So Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, found it irreconcilable with the hope of the resurrection, as it is to this day, for that matter. Justin Martin told Trifo, a Jewish opponent, Now this is interesting. Listen to this. He told him that if he encountered any Christian who dared to blaspheme God by asserting that there is no resurrection of the dead, but that their souls are taken up to heaven at the very moment of their death, do not consider them to be real Christians. That is a serious indictment. So, What would that mean for the Protestant world of this day? They've got a problem. According to Justin Martyr, you are not to consider them real Christians because the real Christian believes in the second coming of Christ, Mm -hmm. the trump will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, those that are living in Christ will be translated in a moment in a twinkling of the eye and together with the resurrected will meet the Lord in the air. And those resurrected are not ones that were in heaven. No. And that comes back to the grave and are then resurrected. No. They are sleeping in the grave until the resurrection. If you read the book of Daniel, he's plainly told you will rest, you will sleep, Mm -hmm. And you will stand in your lot on that day, the second coming of Christ. So this is what it means to be an Adventist. To believe in the second coming of Christ as the hope for all humanity. And the hope lies in the resurrection which will be granted by Christ on condition. Mm -hmm. Of obedience. That's biblical doctrine. Now, why are we doing this again? Because we receive so many questions yes. about this issue. And it needs to be stated quite clearly that this is not just an issue of Seventh day Adventists mm-hmm. against the rest of the world. This is a biblical issue. Yes. And here is a Baptist. Yes. And he puts it very plainly. And and also, we're doing this to make people aware that even though you might not 100% think the same or believe the same as this Roman Catholic system portrays it, if you are in ecumenism with them, if you have solidarity with them, then you are acknowledging that this is okay. You are willing to compromise on something where there can be no compromise. No compromise. Did Christ make a compromise with the Sadducees and said they can continue to believe what they believed? No. Did Paul compromise with them? No. No. He mentions Martin Luther and he says, is on record to having flatly denied that the soul is immortal. Luther generally understands the condition between death and the resurrection as a deep and dreamless sleep without consciousness and feeling. 
Luther therefore says nothing about souls without their bodies enjoying true life and blessedness before the resurrection. They sleep in the peace of Christ. So this study I found very interesting. He states here, Today quite a number of Christians are attached to modified doctrines of purgatory as a means not merely of purifying those already saved but also of bringing all humanity perhaps to eventual salvation. If you believe in the second chance doctrine mm. then you basically believe in a form of purgatory. Yeah. And also if you like the part says their eventual um, salvation for all humanity because like we've read even if you're if you weren't living up to what you should have and you might be lost somebody can now pray for you on the other side well that's not catholic doctrine exactly their their doctrine states that if you die in a state of grace mm. which means that you went to confession okay. or you received absolution then you go to purgatory if you die in a state of mortal sin, according to them, you bypass purgatory, you go straight to hell. Okay, so the indulgence, that gets you just out of purgatory. Just gets you out of purgatory. Okay. So you, there where you burn off the, your sins, yes. but you're still saved. Now, it is not a forgiveness of sins. It is a relinquishing of the penalty of sin. But the Bible tells us that Christ bore the penalty in my behalf. It is a negation of the atonement of Christ. Mm -hmm. It is a blatant affront to the Christian doctrine of salvation in Christ and Christ alone. That's why you can venerate saints. That's why you can violate all the commandments of God mm -hmm. and get away with it because the very basis of the Christian doctrine has been denied. So he states, the idea of universal salvation will be discussed in chapter 6 and 9 of this particular book. As for purgatory in any form, there is simply no biblical warrant for such a doctrine. We have no evidence that Jesus or the apostles ever taught the doctrine even in a weak seed form. There's nothing but nothing in the scriptures. It is also noteworthy that as Dr. Harris correctly observed, resurrection and judgment are inseparably associated. That's a very important point. Resurrection and judgment are linked and cannot be separated. Yet, as he also conceded, it is hard to find any reference in the New Testament to a judgment of the individual at death. It's not only hard, it's impossible. Mm. Unless you want to say it is given for man once to die and thereafter the judgment. But it doesn't say that the judgment will take place at, death. at the death. It says it will take place. Yeah, the, correct. Of course, this is also a further reason to reject the whole idea of saved or lost souls going to heaven, hell or purgatory at death. Biblically, Judgment occurs at the end of the age on God's appointed day, not before. Isn't this what Adventists believe? Mm -hmm. And here is a Baptist confirming that this is exactly what the Bible teaches. In contrast to the confusing diversity of Christian traditions stands the clear and consistent teaching of Scripture. Jesus' second coming through which God's kingdom is finally achieved, will be an event which intervenes in our time and our world to wind up, judge, and transform our history. This is exactly what Adventism stands for. That's why the name is Adventism. Yeah. So when the Son of Man comes in glory, the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
This is obvious from the mere fact that a generation will be alive on earth when it occurs and will experience rapture without dying. Now this is not a secret rapture, as many teach. Mm. This is the final resurrection. Yeah. And then he quotes the verses. The resurrection to immortality and everlasting fellowship with Christ will occur only in and through that event, through the second coming of Christ. So this is what a Baptist pastor believes. So now that we've studied this whole issue of death, mm. we can understand that the veneration of saints and of Mary is not biblical. So any apparition of that nature cannot be Mary because she's sleeping in a state of unconsciousness according to the scriptures, right? They, of course, teach that she never died, that she went bodily to heaven. Yeah. But if you go to Jerusalem, you will find various graves of Mary, so it's a very confusing issue. Now, they've just issued a coin on October 16, 2020. The new Vatican coin depicts mother carrying the earth in her womb. But they also teach that Mary is the ark. Yes. Because she... Contained, contained Jesus, yeah. right? Con which is the embodiment of the law. Yeah. Which, by the way, they negate. <laughs> so now they have Mother Earth as an equivalent. This is syncretism of the highest order. Joining paganism mm -hmm. with Christianity. Something which the Bible condemns in no uncertain terms. So the new coin minted by the Vatican City State depicts a woman carrying the earth in her womb. The artist who designed the coin, which commemorates Earth Day, has said the design was his response to the ecological theme he was commissioned to portray. So he's an Italian sculptor and Catholic who designed the coin, and he told CNA, that's Catholic News Agency, that he wanted to imagine the earth as a young pregnant woman who protects the earth. But they had a festival in Rome, as we've discussed mm -hmm. in a previous occasion, where they honored this earth mother. Yeah, the Am Amazon Senate, That's where right. they had the Pachamama statues and everything. Absolutely. And the Pachamama statue, that is actually the same as this, because it's a pregnant... A pregnant lady. Yeah. So whether they do it in the form of Mary or whether they do it in this form is irrelevant. The image in the coin has been compared to carved wooden figures of a pregnant woman that were on display in churches and at events during Vatican 2019 Synod of Bishops on the Amazon. Those figures referred to by Pope Francis and others as Pachamama, as you just mm -hmm. said, were said by some to depict an Andean fertility goddess, while the Vatican spokesman characterized them more vaguely as symbols of life. The whole point of this discussion is that the world is moving to a point of decision. Either we move along in this current, yeah. and as the children of Israel, they were about to go across into the promised land, mingled with the nations around them, and accepted the worship practices of the nations and led to this great demise. We are on that same yeah. road repeating yeah. the history. The same decision. Are you going to go with this or are you going to stand and say no? Absolutely. So just to make absolutely sure, he is the veneration of Mary in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, the veneration of Mary, mother of Jesus, encompasses various Marian devotions, which include prayer, pious acts, visual arts, poetry, music, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Popes have encouraged it, while also taking steps to reform some manifestations of it. All of the latest popes have been very fervent Mariologists. In conclusion, 
the question at hand is, are we in the moment of decision? Are we going to go along with the stream and follow the dictates of Rome and accept that they are part of the Christian community? Or are we going to come out and be separate? Mm. What is the biblical directive? Come out and be separate. And um, touch not the unclean thing. thing. And I will receive you. Mm. So we are living in very, very troublous times. And God will have to give us wisdom. We are going to discuss in the next one the issue of solidarity. Yes. A word which is being used over and over again by the papacy and, and Protestant publications. Yes. And in the light of what we have just discussed, we want to ask the question, is this kind of solidarity even possible mm. given the directives of Scripture? May God give us wisdom. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the world is so confused and the old battle lines still exist to this very day. And the same confrontations which have plagued the people of God through the ages are now again coming to the fore and God's people will have to make a decision. Help us to make decisions which are in harmony with your word, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.